Good morning, and welcome to the American Lung Association's webcast, COVID-19, a patient education series update for Better Breeders Club members. Before we begin, and as a reminder, at the bottom of your screen, there's multiple application widgets that you can use. All of the boxes are resizable and movable, and you can feel free to move them around to get the best of your desktop space. And for the best viewing experience, we recommend that you use a wired internet connection and close any programs or browser sessions that are running in the background because they could cause issues. For the best audio quality, please make sure that your computer speakers or headset are turned on and that the volume is up so that you can hear the presenters. And also make sure that your media player on your screen is enabled. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please let us know via the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. And if you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A box as well. This webcast is being recorded, and it's going to be available to you tomorrow. You can access it through the same link that you used to register. And now we'll begin the webinar. I do have a quick reminder to you that the presenters cannot give medical advice during this webinar, and you should always consult your personal physician or healthcare provider with any questions you have regarding your specific medical condition. And so I'd like to open with a welcome and a thanks for joining this week's webinar. For more than 115 years, the American Lung Association has been a champion for healthy lungs and healthy air. And today we know our work is more important than ever. I can commit to you that we will remain steadfast in our mission of saving lives by improving lung health and preventing lung disease through education, research, and advocacy. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dorian Doransky, who is our guest speaker at the Betfer and a Better Breathers Club facilitator in California. She is going to be sharing with us information about addressing emotional health and COVID-19, um, both um, in a similar fashion to what she has done at a local level. And now I'm so happy to welcome her to join us at a national level. So Doran, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Bev, and I am thrilled to be here with a big, huge Better Breathers Club today. Um, I am used to sitting around in a room together and enjoying hanging out with each of you. And, um, and then actually last fall, even before COVID hit, we didn't have access to the room where we were meeting anymore. So we actually created a Zoom-based Better Breathers group last fall. So we were well positioned to um, to do this um, social distancing thing when that happened. Um, but I can't run a Better Breathers Club when you all are on mute. So I have invited three guests to join me today from our Better Breathers Club, and they will be helping me with a presentation. I will introduce you to them in a moment. Um, right now, I just wanted to mention to you our objectives and um, plans for today. We are going to talk about addressing emotional health during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, specifically, we're going to cover four topics. One is reviewing the emotional toll of living with chronic lung disease. So even before COVID, um, we, we recognize how stressful it can be to live with chronic lung disease in the best of times. And then number two, we're going to talk about signs of stress. Number three, discuss some coping strategies that others have tried and might work for you. And then number four, we want to talk about tips on how you can talk to your doctor and your healthcare providers about your own emotional health, which is so important, equally important to your physical health. There will also be some time for discussion and sharing. Um, please write comments into the Q&A box and we'll stop throughout the session and have a few moments to review what your comments are. Because like I say, I hate running a Better Breathers group without your interaction. So I really hope, you know, I always say you are the experts. I don't have lung disease. I have a bunch of credentials after my name, but I don't have lung disease. So I'm really counting on you to type into that Q&A box your expertise and your tips of ways that you have found that work for you that might be helpful for others. So thank you for doing that. 
So we're going to use this audience poll uh, software, and I want to just try using it here with this first really simple question, and I hope everybody answers it. Everyone should have an answer. The simple question is, have you ever attended an in-person American Lung Association Better Breathers Club meeting? So please um, scroll over either the yes or the no, click your answer, and while you are doing that, I want to introduce you to my guests here who are part of my um, Better Breathers group. Um, first, I'd like to introduce you to Ellen. Ellen, would you be willing to introduce yourself, maybe tell us a just a briefly, what is your history with lung disease? And say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. I was uh, diagnosed with uh, emphysema, severe emphysema, 14 years ago. And um, my first PFT a technician advised me to ask my pulmonologist to refer me to pulmonary rehab. And as mm. a result, the day after I got oxygen, I had my first pulmonary rehab meeting, and that has put me in good stead for the last 14 years. That's all. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. I'm so glad you're here today. And next, I would like to introduce Deborah. Deborah, would you be willing to tell us a bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, yes, my name is Deborah, and uh, I've had lung disease all of my life. I was born with it and they took me to emergency and they can never get me to breathe well. And I've dealt with it all of my life. And finally, I never knowing what was going on after I got older, uh, I ended up going to an allergist. And from the allergist, I went to the pulmonary. And then I went to pulmonary rehab. And when I started pulmonary rehab, it's like I told the doctor and I told them, to walk down a hallway, I could not see myself walking down the hallway without holding on. And you can't believe, now I can go miles in a day, but I have to work on it every day. And I'm, I'm, I'm very blessed to be part of this organization. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. I'm really pleased that you're here with us today. And I'd also like to introduce Irene. Irene, would you like to say hi? and give a little um, brief intro to your um, experience with lung disease? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, my name is Irene. Uh, I have uh, emphysema. I was diagnosed in 1991, and it, it has um, gotten progressively worse. I am also a lung cancer uh, survivor, and I'm delighted to participate in this program. Excellent. Thank you so much. I am so grateful to Ellen, Deborah, and Irene for giving me a little feel of a real Better Breeders group here. Uh, and now let's look at our poll results. And it looks like we're half and half pretty close. 51% of you have attended an in-person Better Breeders Club meeting sponsored by the Lung Association and 48.7% have not. So I want to say a hearty welcome to all of you, to those of you who have attended previous meetings, and especially to those of you who have not. And I want to give you a also very personal invitation to join a local meeting. And um, at the end of today's presentation, Bev will come back on to talk about how you can find an in-person club and if you are, happen to be in the San Francisco Bay Area and would like to join our Zoom-based meeting, um, we would welcome you as well. And I believe that the information on how to log into our meeting is being posted on the website. So um, especially those who are local to the San Francisco Bay Area, we'd love to have you. All right, let's get into the topic for the day, which is emotional health. It's such an important part of our life. Um, people who are emotionally healthy are in control of their thoughts, their feelings, and their behaviors, and they feel better equipped to handle the challenges and stressors of life. Especially right now in these difficult times, it is so important to focus on our emotional or mental health as well as our physical health. So I'm so grateful to you for joining us today because that tells me that you are interested in this topic. 
So thank you for being here. Um, we've all been living this for a while since what, mid-March? The major stress that is COVID-19. Mm. Uh, a major a stressor can be any event or environment that you might consider demanding, challenging, or threatening to your safety. And you know, everyone reacts so differently to stressful situations. However you respond can depend on your background, the things that make you different from other people and the community you live. There's just, you know what, and there's no right or wrong way to, um, to react. Um, so let's not waste time kind of judging ourselves. Our reaction is whatever it is, but we can learn to cope with it. Um, people who may respond more strongly to the stress of the COVID-19 crisis might be one of the following categories, either older people or people living with chronic diseases, because you know there's been a lot on the news about them being at high risk for severe illness, especially from COVID-19. And then there's a lot of stress actually on our children and the teenagers. Um, it, you know, there's been huge disruption in their lives and we have to have some empathy for them as well. And then what about the people who are helping with the response to COVID-19, like the, what we're calling the first responders, the doctors, the ambulance drivers, the healthcare re providers. And then finally, we have to remember those also who have pre-existing mental health conditions, maybe problems mm -hmm. with substance use. Um, this additional stressor can be, you know, the, the straw that broke the camel's back where someone might have been coping decently, but they have pre-existing mental health challenges. And this can be really difficult. Maybe they're not able to access their usual groups, even like we aren't able to access better breeders or mental health groups, 12-step groups. And if you're not able to access those, and that can be really stressful. I do want to please encourage you, if you are experiencing signs of major stress, like those that are on this slide, and you're having a hard time coping with them, please contact your doctor, your mental health provider, or even 911 if you are having difficulty with managing those emotions. Let's talk about signs of stress. And I'd like to go to Ellen, Deborah, and Irene for a minute. You, you see some signs of stress here on your um, slide. But um, I'm wondering, um, the three of you and, and, I'm, and those of you who are not, don't have access to a microphone right now, please write your comments in the Q&A section as well. But first of all, um, let's start with Deborah this time. Um, what are signs of stress that you have been experiencing, especially in relationship to COVID-19? Leaving the house. I, Tell me about that. Well, I have many masks that I wear, but I don't want to leave the house for fear of, it, of catching it. And now we mm -hmm. are starting to open up a little bit. And I did go out of the house, and I stopped by the church and picked up a book yesterday. Oh, wow. And that was that your first time out? Well, I'd not let anybody see me. Another thing is, yeah. I have face I have cancer on my face, and I had it operated on mm -hmm. in the mid February. So I've been inside, and I've not let too many people see me. Oh wow! But I don't look bad. So you have that okay. additional stress. Uh -huh. Yeah, I've had additional stress, and wow. now I've uh -huh. seen a couple people and, and said, this is what I look like now. Uh, anyway, mm -hmm. but I look okay. I'm working on wow. it. Uh-huh. Thank you so much for sharing, Deborah, and congratulations on venturing out for that one. Sounds like you, you really limited oh. the environment, made it a very specific task, and um, faced your fears by going on that one errand, and it sounds like it was successful. So congratulations on that. Thank you much. Let's go on. Let's go into Irene. Tell me, Irene, what are signs of stress that you're noticing, especially with COVID-19? Well, I was having uh, a problem sleeping um, mm. because I just couldn't seem to relax. In addition to that, like Deborah, I was very concerned about going out, and I didn't venture out until, like, I think it was... Uh, mid to late April, 
Uh, and I went to the mm. bank, and I wore my mask and my gloves. And although I was uncomfortable, I was uh, happy to see that others were wearing their mask and gloves, too. And I felt a little bit better about that. But I was also mm. very distracted. Uh, I tried to drive into the garage with the, one of the doors open on my car. Oh, and no. um, that oh, didn't no. work out too 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 well. Oh, um, no. Yeah, but fortunately there wasn't a whole lot of damage. There's white paint all over the door, which which they'll be able to remove. But um, I'm doing a lot better now. I was also eating a lot of cookies, and when I finally realized oh. I couldn't get into my pants, I gave that up. But uh, I'm oh, doing yeah. very well now, and and I'm I'm going to. Uh, venture out again very soon. Mm. Thank you so much. So, you know, you're you're reminding me that that whole kind of clumsiness or doing things that you wouldn't normally do that you normally do on autopilot, like driving into your garage. Um, I actually dumped a whole pan of um, herbs that I was sprouting the other day and got dirt all over my kitchen floor. And I think that's another sign of stress, similar to you running into the garage. Um, and then also thank you for bringing up the concern about the eating changes and those those who have chronic lung disease often have difficulty with nutrition one direction or the other already where um, either you're not getting enough calories or too many calories. And you're right, the stress can exacerbate, can increase that um, nutritional balance issue. So I'm glad to hear that you were able to correct that. But um, that can be a, um, a major health concern as a result of the stress. Um, Ellen, how, how are you doing with the stress related to COVID-19? Well, you know, I always have a slight tremor, but it mm -hmm. has been really increasing lately, and I'm sure it's due to stress. Um, I was writing checks the other day, and I have to print because my handwriting just uh, isn't legible because my hand just goes shaking all over. And I'm mm, kind of mm. glad right now I can't go into a restaurant and order soup because it would never stay on my spoon <laughs> when I was lifting it up, lifting it up to my mouth. But um, <laughs> it, as, long, as long as I'm confined to my house, I can shake all I want. Nobody's going to care. <laughs> so that's okay. <laughs> The problem I love is your when I'm working, humor, Alan. When I'm, working, when I'm working on the computer and my hands are shaking, I might get mm -hmm. several of the same letters in a row, you know. But mm -hmm. otherwise, mm -hmm. it, it's it's manageable. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're being gentle on yourself and just realizing that things might be a little bit harder right now. They might take longer, and that's okay. You just give yourself the extra time and the extra grace to make it happen. Well, you have to be kind to yourself. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, thinking about stress and chronic lung disease, um, did you know 15 to 20% of individuals with COPD have anxiety and or depressive symptoms? So um, you're not alone if you are experiencing those. And with the COVID-19 stress, very likely it's even higher than that one-fifth of people with chronic lung disease. So once again, please, if you're experiencing that, please talk to your um, primary care provider or your mental health professional as soon as possible because you really don't want to suffer alone. Um, you can see here some of the signs of stress that others have reported. And... Um, Remember that um, research shows that managing anxiety and depression can increase your ability to stick with your prescribed lung disease treatment, improve your physical health, and reduce your medical costs. So there really are important reasons beyond simply trying to feel better to address your emotional health. It really is. You're a whole person. Their mind-body connection is alive and well. And it's really, really important for you to address your emotional health. You know, it's interesting. Um, 
so often, and, and we're talking about COPD, <clears throat> but if you have other chronic lung disease, there's a lot of overlap here in what we're going to talk about, which is the overlap between chronic lung disease and emotional diagnoses like anxiety and depression. So often, shortness of breath, hyperventilation, they kind of happen with both. You can get a, a chest discomfort from anxiety and depression. You can also get a chest discomfort from, you know, the fatigue of being short, short of breath. You can get, um, Ellen was talking about the shaking. Well, you can get that purely from anxiety and depression too. Um, the fatigue is very common in between both of them. So sometimes it's that chicken and the egg thing. And actually, I've actually seen people who are having a hard time getting their COPD symptoms under control, and they decide to humble themselves and go ahead and seek treatment. A lot of people seem to be kind of resistant to anxiety or depression treatment, but they say, okay, I'm just going to humble myself and do it. And their COPD symptoms actually improve once their anxiety or depression is managed better. So um, I, I want you to think about that overlap of symptoms and how it gets to be a vicious cycle. So maybe you're feeling short of breath from your COPD. You get panicked. In fact, I think that is even showed here on the next slide here where um, – you get anxiety because you're feeling short of breath and then you start to breathe faster and your muscles tire. Then your shortness of breath increases any, even more, which causes this huge vicious cycle. I mean, anxiety, panic, and inability to control um, your emotional health. So please don't underestimate that, that connection between shortness of breath and your emotional health. And be sure to address both because if you're experiencing one, addressing that will help the other as well. What about watching the news? I don't know about you, but I have had to really limit my news intake. So, oops. Um, sometimes watching the news will cause those worrisome thoughts and worsen the anxiety, which will worsen the breathing symptoms and maybe even cause you to feel the need to go to the hospital. And, it, and that can be the trigger for that whole vicious cycle we were talking about. Um, let's think about this scenario here on the slide. So you're watching the news about COVID-19 and then you start thinking about, well, what if I test positive for the virus? And then you start worrying about dying in the hospital. And then, you know, we've all been seeing on the news how people in the hospital can't even have guests, and so then you're alone, and then that's just causing more anxiety, and I'm probably freaking everybody out right now just talking about it, right? Um, so it, it is really important, especially dealing with lung disease, to, to be wise about this and to think ahead about, um, you know, but planning and worrying are two different things. I really encourage you to plan ahead, but then once you've made the plans, stop the worrying. Um, and in fact, I have some friends who struggle with worrying, and what they've said is um, they give themselves 15 minutes a day to worry. So if you really feel the need to worry, now it's one thing to plan, like how am I going to get my food? How am I going to see my doctor? How am I going to get tested for the virus if I feel I need it? That's simply planning. If you feel like you're worrying a lot and that you really need to worry, go ahead. Um, my friend, she worries from 4.30 to 5 p.m. each day. And she tells us, don't even call me at that time. That's my worry half hour. So if you need a worry half hour, I really encourage you to take it. Let's go on, and we're at another poll here. So I'm interested in what you're thinking here about when you're watching the news about COVID-19 and you start to think about an anxiety-producing thought, what are you most likely to do? So you see some options here, and I would like to turn back to Ellen, Deborah, and Irene, and maybe we can start with Irene this time. And I would like to hear what do you do when you feel anxious, either specific to COVID or just in general? Um, how do you cope with when you're starting to feel anxious? Irene, could you start? 
Well, I used to uh, go for a cookie or two or three or six. <laughs> but um, since I started uh, to gain weight, um, I no longer do that. I just distract myself with something else. If If the news is very disturbing to me, I stop watching it. And just go and do something mm. else. Mm-hmm. And that well, seems that to work. Or you can well. even show, find a fun show or a comedian or something. If you want to still watch something, it doesn't have to be the news. That's very true. Hmm. Thank you, Irene. Ellen, how about you? Well, I don't turn off the TV because then I worry that I'm missing something. But I turn away <laughs> from the TV. <laughs> And I do what Irene has uh, stopped doing. I immediately head to the kitchen, and I can still hear the TV, but I'm much more mm-hmm. absorbed in what's in the refrigerator or uh, not cookies because I don't keep that kind of thing. And I find I want something warm and uh, soft, comfort food. And I'm eating a lot of oatmeal which is, you know, not that bad for me, but still has more calories than I need. Hmm. Yeah, I hear you. Oatmeal can be pretty yummy with blueberries and maybe some almonds in it. The blueberries Um, blueberries I definitely put on it, and I'm using the pretend mm -hmm. sugar. So um, Uh it isn't isn't terrible, and it is warm and it is soft, but it's still Yeah, comforting. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ellen. And Deborah, how about you? What do you do when you feel anxious? Uh, I do, well, I go out and walk my dog for one. And Mm -hmm. another thing I do is um, I've got a machine that I use to do push-ups on. And it's also go. And it's also like a, a gazelle or what have you, something where you can go back and forth. I never used it until this time. I've had it for years. Hmm. And it's taken hmm. my mind off of everything. And I've lost some weight because of I'm everything going you. on. And I I just need to get away from things or else I crochet. I make baby blankets. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So, Very nice. Well, yes. Thank you. But it's something I have okay. to do for my body. If I don't do this for my body, my lungs will get worse. And yeah, I practice a lot of right. breathing exercises. Mm-hmm. And it's too important for me yeah. to keep going. Mm-hmm. Wow. And that's about all, all that's right. about it. Mm-hmm. Should we look at the results of our poll here? Let me see here. Yeah, it I'd looks be happy like. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Beth. Sorry, I was jumping right in there, Doran. I just wanted to share a go couple people it. have come up with some great ideas. Um, Mary Ann mm-hmm. was sharing that she's found some mindfulness sessions from YouTube that really work well for her. Mm-hmm. Catherine's been enjoying going for a walk or working in the yard. We've got um, Victoria, who's found a list of TV shows that make her feel good that she's posted. Um, all sorts of people are giving some great examples of what they're doing. Excellent. Very good. And you can also see here on the slide, it looks like the winning one is to remind yourself that you're taking all the precautions to stay safe. And um, and that's just so important to do that. So um, you've got a lot of strategies. The Lung Association gives a lot of options on the website that you can use, and um, you do the best you can, and then time to trust. Um, Let's keep moving forward. Boy, I'd love to keep talking about all of these topics, but let's keep moving forward because I want to introduce you to the concept of breathlessness crisis. And um, there's more Mm -hmm. information about this on the web, on the American Thoracic Society website for free. Um, In fact, you can see here there's something called a patient information series called Sudden Breathlessness Crisis. It's available at www.thoracic.org. So if this is interesting to you, I'm just going to introduce it to you very quickly, but you could look it up. And then there's also a professional document here 
that's also available on the website for free to talk about this concept. But I just wanted to introduce it to you. Um, a sudden acute breathlessness crisis happens when people who are probably like you get short of breath periodically, but suddenly their shortness of breath overwhelms their ability to cope. And it's a combination of worsening shortness mm. of breath. Dyspnea is the fancy word for breathlessness or shortness of breath. So worsened dyspnea combined with maybe overwhelming your ability to cope with it, combined with maybe your, you, you just don't have the, the skills to deal with. It's just gone beyond what your ability to do. It's overwhelmed your environment. It's overwhelmed maybe your loved ones who are around with you, and you feel this crisis and you end up going to the emergency room. So this paper that I mentioned to you is trying to give people tools so that they have more resources available when this inevitable happens and they feel overwhelmed in their ability to cope. And they can practice in advance these tools, kind of like we nurses and doctors practice CPR, so that if we find somebody who their heart has stopped and they need to be resuscitated, we don't even think about it. We've practiced it in advance. We all know what to do. And everybody has their part, and we try to jump into action. And this, this um, document is encouraging you to create a plan in advance that you practice with your family and loved ones and whoever you live with so that when your breathing is getting worse and you're having a hard time coping, you will be able to jump into action without even thinking about it and hopefully um, get some relief. Um, now, there, we use for this an, a mnemonic, comfort, and each of the letters gives an idea of something that a person might do to help their breathing when they feel in crisis. I'm not going to spend the time now to go over it in detail, but um, that gives you some ideas of where to start. But I encourage you to think of all the different things that you do beyond what's listed in this document. And for example, here's a, um, a list that I put together several years ago and put in a, a chapter of a book actually that I wrote. Um, and this on the left side shows different ideas of things that might be helpful for you that a professional might prescribe. In the middle are things that you can basically do on your own, and you can even see a yoga class that we did. for. Pe These are all people with COPD doing yoga, for example. And then on the right side are more complementary therapies that maybe you'd go to a, a, a provider that's maybe not from Western medicine, but maybe like a um, mindfulness practitioner or a bio biofeedback expert or somebody like that. But these are just some additional ideas for you to keep in mind as you're thinking about what else can I do to manage my breathing? Let me think about it now while my breathing is basically fine mm -hmm. so that if I run into trouble, I have a good number of strategies in my toolbox that I have practiced when I'm not in crisis and I know what to do without even thinking about it. So let's get back here to this whole idea of COVID and sadness. I want to really stress to you, just like breathing, you have good days and bad days, and then you have crisis days. Well, sadness is like that too. You can have good days and bad days, and then crisis days. If you're having a crisis day, please talk to your professional um, or your doctor. But it's okay sometimes to have a sad bit day. You're not able to see your friends face to face right now. You're not able to go to your pulmonary rehab program. You're hearing a lot of really sad stories in the news. So it's okay. It's, it's really all right to feel sad. Um, and sometimes simply accepting it helps you feel better, ironically enough. Um, however, I do want to warn you once again about clinical depression, that deep sadness, that kind of crisis sadness or emptiness that goes on and on. And it really can impact your physical health too and your breathing, your sense of shortness of breath. So please um, get that addressed if, um, if needed. Wow, time for another poll. So here's your question, how can you improve your mood? So when you're in those sad days, um, what do you do to improve your mood? And I'm going to give you a few minutes to answer this poll. 
And while you're doing that, I want to turn back to, I, I can't remember who's first. I think we go to Ellen first this time again. And I have a question for you. When you are having a down day, what are ways that you use to improve your mood or coping skills and how have they worked for you? So Ellen, would you be willing to start with an answer to that question? Sure. Um, since I'm really not leaving the house now, except for really, really important things, um, I'm looking out windows. And when I look out my back window and I can see apples beginning to form on my apple tree, and that's, that's a happy thing. And if I look out my front window, I'm in a neighborhood that has lots of dogs and lots of babies. And I see the people walking up and down the street, and I can hear the children laughing. And um, I can see from across the street where I have a liquor store and a meat market, people standing in line to go in one at a time with their six feet between them. And um, <laughs> that, that knowing that people are obeying the distancing requirements and... Um, being careful is something that I find uplifting mm -hmm. and um, beautiful. That that's what I'm doing these days. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, let's see. Should we go to Deborah next? Um, what are your thoughts on this topic? Um, well, uh, the thing that I like to do. Well, okay. One of my big things is prayer and I read mm -hmm. I read books so I do a lot of things to help myself as you can tell because if I don't help myself nobody else will and mm -hmm. I'm sort of like I've been by myself for a long time and I have learned mm -hmm. that I have got to take care of me and I even mm -hmm. have uh, some doctor's telephone numbers I need I can reach out to anybody I need to if I have to but they know I don't practice mm. that. They know that I practice mm -hmm. on trying to take care of myself, even like the deep breathing. I try to teach that to people how wonderful that is. People don't know how well, it, know how, how hard it is sometimes to breathe. And yeah. anyway, I, mm -hmm. I just try to help people with a lot of prayer. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that is really wise so it sounds like ellen's focusing more out watching and interacting um deborah you're focusing more inward toward the prayer both are so important so thank you for bringing up both both points of view and you know prayer can be many things it can be meditation it can be just mm -hmm. focusing on what's happening with you internally or um communicating with your higher power as you see that um, really wonderful and important. Um, Irene, how about you? Well, <clears throat> usually if I'm in a funk, I, um, I take a look at what I have, and I have a great deal. I have a home. Mm -hmm. I have, I'm financially mm -hmm. secure. I'm basically healthy. I have great friends. And that seems mm -hmm. to... to uh, get me refocused on something um, more positive. In addition, I get involved in an activity. I mean, there's brain mm -hmm. games you can play on uh, on the computer. There's American Mahjong. There are just tons of things you can do. Mm. So I, 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 I'm able to get myself out of it as quickly as I got myself into it. <laughs> and like mm -hmm. Deborah, I do mm -hmm. a lot of praying. Mm -hmm. Nice. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's really helpful as well. And um, really good point to use gratitude and appreciation. We can all, no matter how ill we are, no matter what our life situation, we can always choose a perspective of gratefulness. You can have your half hour of worry from 4.30 um, every afternoon, and then you can, for the rest of the day, choose to focus your perspective onto gratitude. And, you know, the fact that we are taking breaths right now, even if they're hard breaths, we can be grateful for that breath as well. So thank you. And I want to go on to the poll results. So let's see what everyone else said. 
Let's see here. So it looks like the winner on this one is focusing on physical activity or hobbies for improving mood. So I wonder if we have a bunch of better breathe or sorry, um, pulmonary rehab graduates in the audience because um, in fact, I worked with a lady who even when she was on hospice, she insisted on going to her condo gym every single day because that was her self-management, um, breathing management mm-hmm. strategy. Um, she felt much less short of breath if she was able to exercise every day. So I'm really glad to see that. Um, I'm also seeing practicing mindful activities. That's kind of what Deborah was talking about. And um, then talking it out with others, you know, just because you're not able to see people physically doesn't mean you can't use Zoom. Everybody seems to be figuring out Zoom or calling someone on the phone, writing your thoughts in a journal. I do that sometimes. And then I look at it and say, I didn't even know I thought that until I wrote it down. Or, you know what, a great breathing exercise is singing or playing an instrument. Big fan of that. And Bev, were there any comments in the Q&A section on this topic? There have been a lot of comments. People are so great about chiming in. I love that Laura likes to feed her birds each morning and watch the squirrels and the chipmunks because that does put a smile to my mm-hmm. face as well. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much. Let's go on to talk about more coping strategies. So, of course, stress is a normal part of life. We've been talking about that. You can't always control it, and God knows we can't control COVID-19, but you can control your response to stress, and that's really what we're talking about. It's about changing our perception, changing where we are putting our focus. And coping strategies are some of those tools that we use to handle stress. And and really, there is no one-size-fits-all. Because, just because you hear that one person is using prayer or somebody's using physical activity or somebody's using crocheting doesn't mean that's going to work for you. But um, there are uh, options that you can use, too. So you can use trial and error to find the skills that work best for you. And, you know, sometimes they don't work every time. So you might find something that works really well once. And that's why it's nice to have kind of a go-to box with a variety of things you can do. I've actually created a, a list that I wrote for myself and then printed out. And if I'm kind of in that funky spot, I go to my list and I have this whole list of like 30 things that have worked for me in the past. And I say, okay, which one am I going to try today? Or you can even cut them up in little strips, put them in a jar and pull one out and say, okay, I'm going to try this one today. But it's nice to have a variety that you can um, draw from. Uh, Here are some ideas. Of course, you'll see there on the right your COPD action plan. This is the one that the American Lung Association has available on the website for free. And if you don't have one, I would really recommend you print it out and you um, fill it out with your primary care provider or your pulmonologist or um, your nurse practitioner so that you know the green section is what to do on a daily basis to stay healthy. Yellow is when things are starting to get a little dicey. What are things you can do to keep your health as strong as possible? And red is when you're really needing additional assistance. But sometimes it's hard to think about what to do when you're feeling stressed like that. And so having it written down helps you remember, oh, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. And you can also see all of these wonderful activities listed here that you can choose and hopefully try next time that you're feeling a little bit funky. And I hope you've really heard today depression and anxiety can be very serious. Um, Some people now with COVID are experiencing feelings or thoughts that they have never felt before. You may not even even recognize it if you haven't felt depression or anxiety before. So I do want to once again encourage you to talk to your doctor, your medical professional about that. If you're experiencing things like loss of interest in things that you usually enjoy, if you feel hopeless, if you're feeling ongoing feelings of sadness, disrupted sleep, changes in appetite. Um, You might even track these things, like get out a calendar and write over several days if you're noticing some of these things. 
are you noticing them every day? And if you are, it's really something to let your doctor know about. I know so many people have been worried about talking to their doctor um, because of COVID, but actually a lot of doctors are less busy than usual. So please pick up the phone mm -hmm. if you have any concerns. Um, and you can always start brainstorming answers with your doctor. So I'm going to turn the time back to Bev now. She has some additional resources from the American Lung Association to share with you. And hopefully we have a few minutes for discussion and additional sharing. I'd love to hear more from you about your coping strategies. And of course, please type in any comments you have in the Q&A section. And I'm turning it back over to Bev now. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dorian. And I do have um, two quick slides, and then we will have time for some questions and further interaction. I want to make sure that everybody knows that the American Lung Association launched a $25 million initiative to end COVID-19 and to defend against future respiratory virus pandemics. And one of the ways that you can help from the comfort and safety of your own home is to join the citizen science study. And so if you go on to lung.org and you request to download the free app to your smartphone or device like that, it'll send you a notice once a day and ask you how you're feeling and if you're having any symptoms and kind of like where, where about you've been out in your community. It just takes a couple minutes. But if lots of us do this all over the country, it's going to give people some really good data that's going to allow us to help proactively track this virus and kind of mm. get another sense for what's going on in the community. Um, as one of the study's co-founders explained, social, distances, social distancing keeps many people protected, but joining together to contribute this kind of data is going to help beat it. So I really encourage you to be part of a movement. I've downloaded it on my phone, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, and it really just takes a minute or two, and it will remind you every day, um, and it's okay if you miss a day or two as well. Um, but again, by joining this, you're going to be part of our COVID-19 action initiative to beat COVID-19, so I encourage you to join. And the last thing that I want to just remind you or share with you uh, before I turn it back over for further conversation is the Lung Association is here for you. We've been around for over 100 years. We're operating in different times, and we want to learn how we can best support you. Um, we do have another webinar um, kind of similar to this, a virtual Better Breathers Club that's scheduled for next month, in which case we're going to be focusing again on COVID-19, but COVID-19 and managing your chronic lung disease. Um, so I encourage you to tune into that. You can register on the Better Breathers Club website uh, at lung.org, um, or you can reach out to us if you need a direct link. Um, I do encourage you to contact the Lung Helpline. You can speak directly to a medical professional about your COVID-19 concerns or any lung health issues. Um, our staff are ready and able and willing, free of charge in over 150 different languages to answer those questions that you have and make sure that you're getting good advice and information. I also encourage you, finally, to join an online support group at lung.org community. Virtual meetings are great. Signing into this is great. Sometimes it's really nice to just jump on and hear what other people are talking about and be able to um, ask your own questions and get advice and support um, virtually uh, for people who are kind of living in the same war, um, situations that you are. So please consider joining that as well. Um, that is it for our slides. Uh, Doran, would you like me to kick it back over to you? Sure. Thank you so much. And I'm not sure exactly when we have to stop. I'd love to talk all afternoon. But um, before we open it up and go back to the um, to the Q and A, I'm wondering if Deborah, Ellen, or Irene have any additional comments you'd like to make, and or we can look through the Q and A. And I'd love to hear what you're all thinking. Uh, I'll let you know. Well, people are very, if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, um, I have a lot of contact with people, even though I'm not out amongst them, 
but I have a lot of contact with a lot of different kinds of people. And I do even have a couple people that stop by my house like a couple times a week. But we sit out front where we're not close to each other. And we talk and we share mm-hmm. things. And it is important to have a good support group of some sort, whether it's online. I'm going to go online and because I believe in support all around because not everybody understands what we are going through. And people just think, should it just blow you? Yeah, sure. But we have problems, and they are so, they're very important to us. And we need to find people that care about us and know what we are going through, how, how hard it is to breathe some days. And I want to yeah. thank you so very much. So thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Let's, I'm actually figured out how to look in the Q&A section, so I was going to go through some of these comments. Um, Pat was asking for the website for the app on the COVID-19 science study again. So um, perhaps we could, um, Bev, could you scroll back so that they could see what the website is again? And then you know what, Dorian, somebody would... else was... Hmm? I just sent it out to everybody, so you should have it at your oh, fingertips great. now. Oh, oh good. Okay. Thank you. And then Laura shared a book. It's a daily reading book that she found um, valuable. It's called Until Today. But the idea of having any kind of um, daily affirmation book, there's many of them out available. Um, I think that's another wonderful idea to give a little bit of routine to your day and to give some focus um, for um, reminding yourself to um, to be grateful and to let go of the things that you can't control and that sort of thing. Um, Thank Joyce you. has a question. Joyce has a question about a new diagnosis of non-tubercular mycobacterial infection, which can be a really scary thing. That's a um, that's a, an infection that often causes something called bronchiectasis, which is where the, the um, sputum, the mucus deep in your lungs kind of hardens up and it it gets stuck in the airways and you it's kind of like a really bad chronic bronchitis. It can be hard to breathe. You feel like you need to cough a lot, and it just doesn't come up as quickly as you wish. Um, it can be very, very distressing. Um, I think, Joyce, all of the principles that we've been talking about today apply for NTM as well. Um, it can be even more frustrating, though, because I don't think there's quite as much information out about NTM as there is about, say, COPD. But I do want to reassure you, you are not alone. It's really frustrating, and a lot of the COPD um, information that you find is applicable, especially the information around chronic bronchitis um, related to how you can manage your own disease and so forth. So I really encourage you to get involved with a regular Better Breathers group um, because I find that the the best knowledge is from the people who attend the group because they're the experts in living with lung disease. And even if it's not exactly your lung disease, it could still be really helpful. Oh, here's Rhonda mentions that she has chronic bronchiectasis. And um, so that would be an example, even though she doesn't have NTM, Joyce, somebody with chronic bronchiectasis would probably really relate to your experience as well. But Rhonda's asking, she's feeling a lot of anxiety about this whole reopening and going off sheltering in place. There's there's a certain comfort to sheltering in place and knowing that you're not being exposed to anything. And it sounds like her family is is kind of um, making fun of her or um, scoffing at her desire to continue to protect herself when she doesn't want to go out into public where she might be exposed to the virus. And that's a really tough place to be, Rhonda. I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, and I suspect others here are also 
um, challenged with that. Um, so once again, I want to reassure you, you're not alone. You've come to the right place. I really hope you can look on the Better Breathers list and find a group that you can connect with. Um, and then maybe even talk to your own medical and um, and mental health professionals to get some additional support um, because you're not being a baby, you're not being a wuss. You are, I always tell people, you're the CEO of your own body and you know what your body needs. And if your body needs to be protected a bit more than the bodies of your family members, we honor that. And if they don't honor that, that's actually, that's a problem. Um, but it's not a problem with you. So um, please reach out, get the support you need to stay strong, to take care of your health in the way that you know you need to. And thank you for being here today. Um, and then Mark is asking if others live in an area where the majority of people are ignoring masks and social distancing and um, we're not able to talk with each other right now, but I bet there are a bunch of people here who are having that problem. Once again, I think there's opportunities to connect virtually with the Lung Association. You know what? Also, I want to make sure you know about, um, I believe it's 1-800-LUNG-USA. Am I, do I have the right phone number? The American Lung Association has the absolute, all right. The American Lung Association has the best free 800 number that is staffed by professionals. It's registered nurses and respiratory therapists, as well as some tobacco cessation counselors. And they are absolutely amazing. So 1-800-LUNG-USA, um, they're, they're mostly during the day, but if you leave a message, they'll call you back the next day. So if you are feeling the need for support, like what to do if, you know, and you're just feeling frustrated about people ignoring masks, social distancing, if you need more information about mycobacterium, whatever it is, please call them. They are amazing. And they'll even um, like develop a relationship with you. If you find one of the nurses or respiratory therapists who you especially connect with and you understand each other, often they'll make arrangements to, um, to be able to talk to the same one in the future as well. So, um, Mark, I hear you on that. It's really frustrating. And um, please reach out and um, get support and do what you need to do. And don't be, don't be bothered by the, the social pressure. You know, you wear a mask, you do the social distancing, you stay home when you feel like you need to. Um, Bev, Craig is asking about when this talk will be available again and how um, how he can get access to that. So I'll, I'll ask you to answer that. Absolutely, and that's actually um, a good kind of closing comment as we're wrapping up our hour. Um, Craig and others who have asked, you absolutely have access to these slides. They're, we're going to send you an email out in about 24 hours. It's going to be the same link that you use to register, but that's how long our system takes in order to make the recording. A recording of this presentation will be available on lung.org. So maybe you've got a friend, Better Breathers Club member or otherwise, who you think could really have benefited from visiting this. You can forward a, the, the lung.org website to them and have them register, and then they can um, watch this on demand themselves. Um, I, I do want to put in a quick plug real quick that um, before you jump off, there's a quick survey that we're going to ask you to fill out. I know surveys, some people love them and some people don't love them, but we really need your information because this is a new format and we want to know what went well and what, went, what we could do better next time because we want to make sure that this time is engaging and fulfilling and useful to you. So if you have suggestions, we really want to hear them and please do participate in the survey. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to hand it back over to Joanna in just a second, but I want to appreciate and acknowledge all of our speakers, um, the members, the facilitators, all of you who chimed in um, with questions and comments who helped make this um, learning hour the best that it possibly could be. I so appreciate it. Dorian, you've got an amazing talent as a facilitator. It was great being able to watch you shine. I'm going to turn it over for you, to you for your official BBC um, closing, but um, with the gratitude of the American Lung Association, thanks so much for doing this. 
Oh, thank you so much, Bev. I really enjoy spending time with you. And I also want to say a special thank you to Deborah, Ellen, and Irene, um, the three of you. And I know every single person listening would have similar, really valuable comments. Um, it's just I happen to know these three. So thank you to each of you. I just want to have a moment of silent appreciation to you. And I wish you all the very, very best. Please reach out. Please, um, especially if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, contact me. I'll put you on our listserv, and I'd love to have you join our um, Better Breathers group or join whatever group is in your area. And thank you to Bev and Nicole for inviting me to join you in this meeting today. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. So long. Stay safe. Bye.